7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Matthew 1, 20 through 23. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because of what is conceived is in her from, is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Isaiah 9, 6 through the first part of verse 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Luke 1, 30-32. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you so much for your promises. And Lord, you, um, you knew that we could not get it done. You knew that we were in trouble. You knew, Lord, that we needed uh, a sacrifice and that you were willing to do that. And Lord, on Christmas, it truly is uh, a day of gifts, the greatest gift, eternal life through you, born Lord, so that you might die in our place. It's, it's crazy. It's amazing. And we just thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you have made a way for us that even this morning, all these thousands of years later, we can continue to celebrate Christmas. We can continue to come and worship you. We can continue to come and learn and grow and understand uh, and know you more. And we can continue to come before you together and bring our, our requests to you. And that you continue to care and love. And that you are able to do what we cannot. And so, Lord, we just bring our prayer request this morning before you. Lord, we just want to lift up to you, uh, Lord, uh, Denny and Sylvia Hall's grandson, Landry. Yeah, nine years old. He's been through so much, Lord. Uh, all of these years, um, just had a hard time, Lord, with uh, leukemia. And then now, Lord, his uh, kidneys and uh, going to Seattle Children's Hospital and trying to figure out what's going on. I just ask God that you would be with Landry. I pray, God, that you would be healing to his kidney, to his body. I pray that you might give the doctors wisdom. I pray, Lord, that you would be with his family, and that you would bring, uh, bring them peace. We just give them to you and ask, would you, would you work to bring healing and do what only you can do? Uh, Lord, we also uh, want to lift up to you. Uh, Lord, we just pray for Phyllis Marks. And, Lord, we just miss her, and we just love her, and we just thank you, Lord, for all the many years uh, that she was here with us, and we got to see and talk with her. And, Lord, she's still part of our family, even though, uh, Lord, she's uh, moved away, and we, we still just love her, and we just ask, God, that you would be with her and bring healing to her body. And we thank you, Lord, that she's uh, at her house, and, uh, Lord, she's doing better, but we just recognize that she uh, still doesn't feel 100%. And so we just pray, God, that you would bring healing to her and uh, that she would uh, be able to regain fully. Uh, Lord, all those abilities and things that she was able to do uh, before and uh, that she would feel better. Lord, we also just want to lift up to you, uh, Lord Mandy Blackweiler and uh, Nate and Aubrey and uh, Lord Ashlyn and the whole family. We just ask God that you would, um, that you would bring healing to her body. We thank you, uh, Lord, that uh, um, she is uh, looking like she's going to be able to go back to her house and uh, do her um, continued recovery there. But God, it's just a crazy situation these anaphylactic situations that have come up now three times in, in like two years. And, uh, Lord, they don't really seem to have fully an answer for what to do. And it's just very frightening to not know what, what's causing these very 
serious life-threatening situations. But we thank you, Lord, that each time, Lord, you, you have provided and you have stabilized and saved her and that she has been okay. And we just ask, God, that you would continue to do so and bring healing to her body and restore her physically. And then we ask, God, too, for, for wisdom to know what, what's going on and what, what to do about it. But at the end of the day, we, we, we lift her up to you, the great physician, and ask God, would you bring healing to her body? And would you give her, ki- her kids, uh, would you give her, would you give Nate, would you give just the whole family uh, peace? Uh, Lord, we also just uh, want to recognize, too, there are many different requests. Lord, here, represented this morning uh, in this room, as well as at home. And you know each and every one, whatever they may be. Lord, all the children that are in here, I remember praying to you as a little boy. And you heard me, I know you heard me, and you helped me. All the way up, Lord, to whatever age we might be and whatever the situations might be. We just again thank you that you hear and that you care. And we give these situations to you. And I pray, Lord, this morning that, and ask that you might give to those this morning what they need. Strength, power, wisdom, peace, hope, strength, perseverance. Lord, whatever it is, we ask that you would take these situations and you'd work them together for good, as you promised to do, Lord, for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And we ask, Lord, that you would give, uh, Lord, just assurance this morning that, that you see, you're the God who sees, you know what's going on, and that you haven't abandoned or left anyone, that you haven't forsaken them, that you're with them, as you said, Jesus, even to the end of the age. And so, Lord, we just ask, God, that you would encourage and uh, each person this morning. And we also thank you, too, for Steve and for bringing healing to his body and for bringing him back and to us. And we just ask, God, that you would speak through him um, in power this morning and that you would just continue to grow us and transform us and change us and make us more and more like you, both as individuals and as a church. We pray all these things and ask them in your great name, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask the kids to come on up in the front here and we'll open up God's word. There's chairs open on the other side too. You guys don't have to move. They'll just fill in over here. There's chairs over there. There's chairs over here. Cool. Yeah, you can come right over here. Right there. There's a chair right there. Yeah. All right. Well, good morning. Good to see you. Hi. Hi. Hello to you guys, but you don't matter. You're not children. So here you go. Hi. (laughs) Good to see you guys this morning. Hey, what's coming pretty soon in a few days? Christmas. Christmas, That's right. It's coming pretty soon. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Christmas story in a way that's a different part of the Christmas story. So first, I'm going to start way back in time before Jesus was born, like a long time, way back before Jesus was born. In a country called Egypt, God's people lived there, and they were slaves. So the fact that they were slaves, yeah, come on over, um, means that they couldn't do what they wanted to or be where they wanted to be. Um, They worked hard. It's good to work hard, but they worked whatever people told them to do. They weren't free. So God's people were slaves, and it's like a waterfall. I don't know what that is. That's weird. Where did the uh, mic go from here? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. 
Uh, and there was a person who was blessed the most times in my life with a car. And so there was some really unusual equipment in there that made it just easy for me. And so I put it in there. And I lost it. And so I had to cut it off so I could stop the engine from running. But I managed to get that car back to being able to run again. I put it in, in my truck. And I took off and I came in the river and pushed him over the river to make it easier. Because I wanted to show him. Now, out of all the people who found Moses, Pharaoh's son found Moses. And he pulled the ram up out of, out of the river and he fed the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh wanted to take care of the baby. And really, the only way to do that is to let things out of the Pharaoh's own hand and let him out. Moses would go up and he would really draw the people out from the camp before Jesus came. But now I'm going to tell you a part of the Christmas story that you can't miss. Because when Jesus came, the wise men came bringing gifts. And they went to King Herod. And they asked, where is the Messiah going to be born? Jesus. And Herod asked the people who were at the banquet, where is he going to be born? And they said, well, tell us where he's going to be born. And they said, born in Bethlehem. And so the wise women went to Bethlehem. Weird words, yeah. Frankincense. It's kind of like frankincense. What a what is that? It's like a good smelling thing. Do you remember the other thing? Myrrh is the other thing. So they brought their gifts um, to Jesus and they worshiped him. And then when they were leaving, they were gonna go back and talk to King Herod, but God warned them not to, and so they just went home. They didn't talk to Herod. Herod knew that the brand new king had been born in Bethlehem. King Herod didn't want anybody else to be king. Who did he want to be king? Himself. King Herod. He wanted to be king. He didn't want there to be a new king. And so the wise men had left. He didn't know exactly where Jesus was born. He knew that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but he didn't know what house. He didn't know what family. And so he sent his soldiers to Bethlehem, And they killed all of the children who were two years old and littler. Isn't that awful? Well, that's kind of like what Pharaoh did, right? He wanted to be in charge. He didn't want anything to keep him from being in charge. And so he did something awful. That's what King Herod did. But God warned Joseph and Mary, and they took Jesus in the middle of the night, and they left Bethlehem, and they went to Egypt, and they escaped. And so Jesus was saved just like Moses was saved. And Jesus, just like Moses, would grow up and save his people, you and I, because he would grow up and teach and heal, and then he would die on the cross for us, and then they would put his body in the grave, and then he would rise from the dead, and then he would talk to his disciples, and he would tell them that he's going to prepare a place for them, and he was sending the Holy Spirit, and then he went up to heaven, and he's returning one day, And he's alive, and he has saved us. We are forgiven. We're God's people. Um, We get to live with God forever because of what Jesus did. So here's another part of the story, and this is a hard thing. And uh, I share this even with um, people your age because it's important to know this, I think. God made sure that Jesus was rescued from Bethlehem. But then there were some other kids who were killed by Herod. What Herod did was wrong. And when that happens, when those kinds of things happen in life, it makes us wonder, why did God let that happen? Why didn't he stop it? Does, wouldn't that, isn't that what you would think? Why did this happen? Why wasn't everybody rescued? And I just want you to know that that's in the Bible. That that's something that happens in life. Sometimes things happen in life that seem wrong, they seem unfair, they're very sad, we don't understand why God didn't stop it from happening. And in the Bible, in the story of Jesus' birth, is that thing that we wonder about. But what we know is that we always have hope, because Jesus brought hope 
like, you know, even if uh, the worst thing is to happen, we know that we go to live with God forever. So even the worst thing can't hurt us. <laughs> and that's the kind of hope we have, even when bad things happen in this world. Now, that might be a part of the Christmas story that you haven't really thought of very much, and I'll tell you why. It's so sad, we actually don't sing very many songs about it because it's so sad. We read it, we think about it, and then it's a hard thing to think about. But that's one thing we do here at church when we come. We don't only think about the happy things, we also think about the sad things, because everybody has things that happen in their life that are sad, and you have to know that this is a place where you can take that, and you can ask God questions, and you can tell him how you feel, and you know that he knows all about those kinds of things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you very much for the time we've had in your word, and we pray that you would help us to learn who you are more and more, and that we can trust you. Even when sad things happen, you're always working, and you can always make things right in the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, you guys can go ahead and go, and uh, everybody else, you can stand up and greet one another in the name. Oh, sorry. There's a whole we have a, some baby dedications this morning. Oh, yes. Oh. So the kids stay here. I'm sorry. Kids, stay, kids here. stay here. You're almost, you're almost done. Yeah, so we have some kids we're dedicating this morning, so the families come on up. Oh, yeah. You, you're the right family. It's just, just I'm the forgetful pastor. So, yeah, if you have other family, they can come up too. And, uh, yeah. All right. So, uh, one thing that we encourage parents to do is to de dedicate raising their kids in the Lord. And um, so, we'll introduce the children, and then we'll, we'll pray together. And... Um, um, this is a good Sunday to think about the preciousness of kids. So why don't you introduce us to your little one? Hello, this is uh, Salome Cassidy Trimble. Uh, she was born July 28th, so she's like four and a half months right now. She's a, she's a sweet little baby. <laughs> and we, yeah, we want her to grow up uh, to know the Lord and uh, ask that he would just bless her and take care of her. That's awesome. So I'm going to ask you to, to stand and commit to do your part for Salome. Um, but first, I'm going to ask mom and dad, uh, is it your intention to raise up your daughter in the Lord? Yes. 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 And uh, is it your desire that God's blessing would rest on your daughter? Yes. Yes. And as the people of God, are you willing to do what... God leads you to do to help these parents and to help Salome as she grows? If so, say, we will. We will. Amen. So I'm going to pray. Hello there. Salome Cassidy, right? Father, we put your blessing upon Salome Cassidy, and we speak your name over her. Um, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray that your blessing would follow her all of her days. Father, we pray that you would guide her steps, help her with those forks in the road that uh, she'll encounter, help her to trust you, help her to call on you. We pray that your presence might be evident to her, um, even when she feels alone. Father, we pray that you would go with her in strength. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. And then over here, why don't you introduce us? So down here, this is CJ, or Corey James Long. We named him after my dad. Um, he was born March 2020, so as you can imagine, he didn't see many people for the first year of his life. <laughs> so we're kind of getting around to this now. He's two and a half, a little over two and a half. He talks a lot. <laughs> but he's super fun, and we want him to grow up in the Lord. Amen. So mom and dad, is it your intention to bring up your son in the Lord? Yes, it is. And is it your desire that God would bless him all the days of his life? Yes. Absolutely. All right. And as the family of God, um, 
will you do whatever God calls you to, to do to help these parents and to help CJ as he grows? If so, say, we will. We will. Amen. All right. Well, CJ, I'm going to pray for you. All right. Father, we thank you very much for CJ, and we pray for Corey James that you would watch over him all the days of his life. We pray that he might see the path ahead. When he has doubts, he might know that he can pray and that you will answer. We pray, Father, that you would guide him through the joy and through the sorrow. Father, we ask that your blessing would rest upon him and that uh, your son Jesus uh, would become his best friend. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit may lead him, and we ask your blessing upon uh, this little guy, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 All right, you may be seated. Oh, I just told you to sit down, but actually you can stand up and greet one another. <laughs> All right, I'll go ahead and ask that you grab a seat. And uh, David, we'll see, if, we'll see if this is working. Is the cordless, is the cordless mic working? Is the cordless mic uh, okay or is it weird? Does it sound okay now? It sounds like I'm in a cave up here, but that's okay. I can always go back to the other mic if it won't work. That's technology. Technology is fantastic until it doesn't work, and then it's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> like passwords. You ever forgot your password? But you wrote it down. You just can't remember where you wrote it down. Or you put it in a file on your computer, and you put a password on that so nobody can get into it, and that's the one you can't remember. It's the, yeah passwords. They tell us to change those all the time, right? Which is good advice, except, man, <laughs> that takes a lot of discipline. All right, so we are in uh, Matthew chapter 2. Um, you heard much of the story that I shared with the kids. Um, before we get into the, the word, I just want to say that um, I share the, I've, for decades, I have shared those kinds of stories from the Word of God with children, um, and I feel confident doing that. For one thing, their nursery tales are horrible, <laughs> right? There's this woman who tricked these two children with candy and then wanted to put them in an oven and cook them and eat them, okay? So the children grow up with stories like that, so they aren't necessarily um, um, disturbed by that. But it's important, I think, for kids to take in at an early age that God's word touches life where it's at, which includes difficult questions, confusing things, like not understanding why something happened. Um, I, I think it's a disservice to children to just paint a rosy picture for them until they turn 12 and then tell them, oh yeah, here are these other stories in the Bible that we didn't tell you. <laughs> and so I... I think that uh, also, sadly, my experience has been that many kids have seen lots of sorrow. Um, they're well acquainted with grief, and nobody needs to really make up a story for them to understand what it is to be, to be hurt or disappointed or confused or whatever. They already know, uh, even at a young age. And so I encourage you, uh, as parents and grandparents, uh, you don't have to go overboard in this regard, but you don't need to, I think, shy away from telling kids, and this is what happened, and this is what happened, and this left people confused, or, or the person was angry, and so they prayed this way. Um, I've talked to many people who struggle in communicating with God because they really don't know how to talk to him, and um, they think that they're not allowed to be angry at God, and they think that because they haven't read the Bible, and there are people in the Bible who God loved deeply who got really mad at him. And you need to know that, you know, at times you will be angry at God and you're going to be disrespectful. And the reason is because you're telling him how you're actually doing, like what you're really feeling. You're really communicating, not pretending. And that is so important in your healthy relationship with God to be able to speak to him what is going on in your life um, and how you're actually feeling. If you can't do that, it's really hard to feel close to God because you feel like you have to pretend to him. And it's difficult 
there's too much distance. So this is not in the message, this just came up from talking with the kids. But here's an example, Jeremiah, uh, we're going to look at Jeremiah a whole chapter in just a moment, even though we're in Matthew. Um, he got really angry at God one time, and his prayer went something like this, God, you're undependable. You're like a creek that I thought was going to provide water, but then it ran out, and it's just, there's dust. That's you. And that's how he felt. He felt like God was undependable, and that God had promised this refreshing, you know, existence, and then he, he wasn't there. That was his prayer. And, you know, God didn't judge Jeremiah for that prayer or tell him, you, how dare you talk to me that way? But he did tell Jeremiah, that's not me. I'm dependable. I'm the most dependable thing in your life. And Jeremiah got closer to God. But he got closer because his first prayer was angry. Because he, he felt angry. And what I'm trying to share is that that is in the Bible. And if that's why it's so good to be in God's Word, because then you have a healthy relationship with God by seeing how other people did it and how they communicated to God, and you, you pray with confidence, knowing that you can say these things to God. This makes no sense. This seems unfair. I don't understand why you're not acting. I, this is, when you're praying like that, at, when you feel that way, then you also feel joy and closeness and intimacy because you've been real with God. And that is, uh, that's so essential uh, to our relationship with him. And uh, I have found over and over again that people who feel far from God have not learned to be honest with him. And that is, it's as simple as they feel distant from their mom or their dad because they've never told their mom or dad how they really feel. And so they feel far apart from him. And the same thing is true in their relationship with God. And this has a lot to do with the message because we're looking at something that seems so unfair. Like, what was God doing? Saving his own son but not anybody else's. I mean, what if you were a parent whose child was killed in Bethlehem? How would you feel? Great job saving your own son, God. Isn't that how you would have felt? That's how I would have felt. And so this kind of prayer, I think, is uh, important in a journey with God. So, uh, first of all, oh, can we put the message up on the screen? There we go, good. We can hope because God is with us. And uh, so here's the first point here. Um, I left my notes at home, so we got, but the, my notes at home are just what's up here. God is with us in rescue. So the first part of Matthew talks about how God is with us, rescuing us. And let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to read these verses here in Matthew. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and he took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. And God's people said, Amen. You can have a seat. And so, um, you know, God is with us in rescue. You can go back to where it says God is with us in rescue. So in, in this passage, um, Joseph is warned in a dream to leave Bethlehem. The wise men have just come, and God warned them in a dream, don't go to Herod. And so they went back home, probably to Babylon. And now the angel warns Joseph, Herod is going to come to the city you need to leave. He's, he's coming to destroy children. And so you'll notice that when does Joseph leave? In the middle of the night. So God gave him this dream, and he did not wait. Would you wait, dads? If someone had told you someone's coming to hurt your child, would you sit back and wait? Uh, the sad thing is sometimes we do. We know that there are destructive things headed our children's way and we just sit back. And sometimes it's because we don't know what to do, we don't know what to say, and we need guidance. But when Joseph received guidance from the Lord, uh, he acted immediately. We should notice that. Uh, and so he took his family to Egypt. Of course, there's been a long relationship between God's people in Egypt, um, and not all of it negative. Uh, sometimes people have fled to Egypt for safety because someone's trying to 
to kill them. And so they take Jesus to Egypt, and they're going to wait till Herod dies. They don't have to wait a long time. Herod died, we're not exactly sure, like 4 BC, 2 BC, somewhere in there is where this Herod died. There's another Herod that shows up later when Jesus is teaching. That's a different Herod, related, but different. This Herod is going to die soon. And this is almost his last act. Isn't that sad? The, near, nearly the last act of Herod's life is to try to kill the Son of God, and then he'll die. And then he gets to look back on his life of um, violence and power and greed. And, uh, the man killed three of his own children, Herod. He actually declared that, or he set up a plan that when he died, one member of everybody's family would be put to death so that people would cry. Because he knew that when he died, nobody would be sad. <laughs> uh, the plan was not enacted. As often happens with, you know, dictatorial, power-hungry people, when he was gone, everybody felt like what? Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. Nobody wanted to, to carry out his orders anymore. Um, what a sad life. A life of violence based on, I want to be the center of the universe, I want to be in charge of everything, I'm willing to kill my own children, I'm willing to kill the Son of God, the Messiah. And then you die, and the Bible tells us after death comes what? The judgment. That, that's something sobering to happen. Now, the good news, of course, is that there's rescue here. So the Son of God, Jesus, is rescued. And they go to Egypt. And just like Moses, G Jesus is the deliverer, the Messiah who is sent. And it doesn't matter what Herod wants to do. Jesus is not going to die. It just doesn't matter because it's not time yet. Jesus is going to die, but not today. Like one time Jesus went into a town and preached, and people were happy with his message, and then he said something else and they got angry and they wanted to kill him, and the Bible says he just walked through them and left. How could that happen? How could he just walk through a crowd that wanted to kill him? Well, because yes, he was gonna die, just not that day. That wasn't God's plan. Uh, all of us are gonna die. That's not a mystery. We don't know when that will happen. We know that all things are in God's hands, so we don't need to have fear about that. Um, so Jesus is rescued, and he goes to Egypt. He's rescued like Moses. In the Gospel of Matthew, there are going to be other things that Jesus says and does where he's like Moses. Um, for example... In chapters 5, 6, and 7, from a hilltop, he will talk about the law of God. Well, what does that remind you of with Moses? Ten Commandments on a hilltop. Uh, he will, in the middle of a wilderness, provide food for people miraculously. Well, what happened when Moses was leading the people of God? Where did they receive food? Middle of a wilderness where there was no food. So he will do things like he's the new... Moses. And that is in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, I, I point that out because as you read through it, you'll see these things. And what God is telling us is the salvation that he has promised since the very beginning is happening in his son. So way back in Genesis, where it talked about God would send a child born of woman who would step on the head of the serpent. That's in Genesis, the very beginning. When he talked about Abraham who was willing to offer his son, but a substitute was made. When Moses is saved in order to save his people, when Moses feeds the people in the wilderness, when Joshua, which is Jesus' name, Joshua's name is Yeshua, Joshua leads the people of God into the promised land. These are all pictures of Jesus. When Jesus comes, all of that is fulfilled in him. Um, that's why he's so significant. So he quotes from Hosea 11.1, 1, Out of Egypt I called my son. And if you read Hosea 11, God talks about Ephraim, uh, like um, Israel. He's his son. And at one point in chapter 11, God says, I have a lot of reasons to be angry at my son, but you know what? I love him. I'm not going to give up on him ever. 
and that's the, this chapter, Hosea 11, out of Egypt I called my son. And so Matthew notices this, and I'm going to point something out here that will help maybe get a handle on this part of Scripture, is these Old Testament quotes, like out of Egypt I called my son, or back in... Um, Chapter 2, verse 6, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. These are all geographical quotes. They go like this. Bethlehem, Egypt, the next one will be Rama, and then Nazareth. They're all places. Boom, 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 boom. And they say something about Jesus. So, out of Egypt I called my son, Um, Jesus is like the new Moses who comes up out of Egypt. God calls him his son. He's rescued. And you've had, hopefully, a story of rescue. So, am I the only one that hears all the popping? David, should I switch to the handheld mic? Okay. Okay. My personality is just so electric that it's interacting with uh, the equipment. So when I was a kid, I lived in Alaska. My dad was stationed at Wildwood Air Force Base, which was like a radar station, part of that system of radar stations up in Alaska. It's no longer a, uh, a base. Little tiny Wildwood was in Kenai. Great place to be stationed, by the way. There's pretty good fishing in Kenai, Alaska, like some of the best fishing in the world. And uh, so it was a great place to be stationed. The base was tiny. I, I don't know how tiny, but it was just, it was little. And um, so there weren't really many services on this base. So we had to drive to Elmendorf for like uh, doctor's appointments and things like that. So my dad took me to Elmendorf up in Anchorage for a dentist appointment in the winter time, and we went up there, had the appointment. On the way home, um, the road got pretty slick, and uh, our car went off the road and into the ditch. And um, driving in Alaska is different. If there's a car off to the side of the road, what, are you, what do you have to do? You have to stop. You might not know that, but in Alaska, you have to stop because that is life and death situation even if it's summertime, because it can be pretty isolated. People can need help, and you could be the only car that comes by in an hour, so um, you have to stop. That's different. In, it's different in California. <laughs> Let me tell you, when I was in college, I was driving to, uh, from home to college, and um, my car started hydroplaning on the road, and uh, I couldn't control it at all, and I hit the side of the hill, and the car went upside down and skidded down the middle of the the road. Uh, I thought I had gone off the side into the Russian River, is what I thought had happened, because I could hear all of these cars going by. No one was stopping. I I could not get out the front because it was smushed. I undid my seatbelt. That's when I realized the car was upside down. Crawled to the back seat area, um, uh, went out the back window, which had popped out, crawled out, and was standing in the middle of the road. (laughs) No one's stopping. Like, you know, oh, there's a car upside down in the middle of the highway with a guy climbing out of it. Yeah, I'm late. I'm, I'm, I gotta, I gotta get my coffee, you know. (laughs) So I will tell you from experience that California is different than Alaska. The rule in California is you don't stop any time for anybody anywhere. (laughs) So in Alaska, you stop. Everybody stops. So different people stopped and tried to help my dad get out. They, They hooked up ropes. They tried to do different things. They could not move the car. We had been there for a while now. We, we carried sleeping bags in the car for safety everywhere we went, so uh, my dad had me stay in the car. I was 10 and um, try to keep warm, but at some point he started to feel like, I don't want my child out here because <laughs> it's cold, really cold and there's no heat and uh, he didn't know how long he'd be there. 
He also didn't know who else would come by because it's, it's getting late. So a man came by, and um, my dad asked him to take me home to the base. So I didn't know this guy at all, really awkward, driving with this stranger in the middle of the snowstorm home. But the, the man took me home, and eventually a man with a, a larger truck came, pulled my dad out of the ditch, and he came home uh, a lot later, like four hours later. Um, and so we were rescued. We were also rescued by God because, um, you know, the car, had, the car had two choices. The car had no choice. The driver had no choice. Going in the ditch or going in the river, and going on the riverside would have meant death. We would have died, but we didn't that day. Uh, now, my dad has died. He died of cancer. He just didn't die that day, and I didn't die that day. Um, you know, some people die when they're little. They die when they're two. Some people die when they're 92. I don't know why. You, you, if you come to me, I cannot explain to you why this is. But what I can say is that day we were rescued. Someday I will die. Guess why it's okay? I stand here already a rescued person. I've already been rescued. Jesus died for me and rose from the dead, conquering sin and death. He's preparing a place for me. If I die, I'm already rescued. But maybe you have a story of being rescued. This is the story that the family of Jesus had, of being rescued. But this family is also going to have another story where they're not rescued. Jesus is not rescued, right? He's falsely accused. He's whipped. He's put on a cross and executed by the government. He's not rescued. So let's move on. Uh, the tragedy. So God is with us in tragedy. Verse 16, 17. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. Herod was always mad. Furious. He sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in that region who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. And that what was fulfilled was spoken by the prophet, a voice. Well, actually, we'll get to that later. But um, So here's Herod. He wants to retain power. He's willing to do anything to retain power, inclu including murdering children, two and under. Bethlehem is just you know, five, six, seven miles from Jerusalem. So he's got to not care what people think, right? He's going to uh, murder these children, like just down the road. And then he's, he's just five miles away. And that gives you an idea of his influence, his power, how inaccessible he was to the common people and his cruelty to do something like that. Um, and, of course, the children are, are innocent. You'll notice, as the Bible tells the story of Jesus, that Jesus is acknowledged as a person like before he's born. He's acknowledged as the Savior who's coming. Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, he goes to visit, well, he doesn't go. He's carried there <laughs> in his mother's womb. Mary and Elizabeth visit together. Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. And the children, John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb and Jesus in Mary's womb, are spoken of as people before they're born. And I just want to point that out, that um, that's the biblical point of view on life. And... What God is doing, even in the womb, developing the person, he's active in designing um, that person. He knows their steps before they're taken when the person is in the womb. This is God's perspective on uh, us as people. And, you know, we have different perspectives than some people in, in the world. One is that we all come from a common heritage, right? So, Genesis... God creates man and woman. We're all related. We're all brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter if you're from the, you know, Philippines or Uzbekistan or South Africa or Brazil or wherever you're from. We're all one genetic heritage. We all trace ourselves back to the same place. Um, that is the point of view of people who read God's word. And what's the plan? When you get to the end of God's word, people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation are gathered together in God's presence to worship him. 
So the goal is that every people group will be there present because we're, that's the goal. Everything that the Bible is shooting for is that Jesus saves, not just Jews, but Jesus saves people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation in the world. That gives us a different viewpoint than people in the world. How a white person might look at a black person or a black person look at a Korean person or a Filipino look at a, um, someone from Argentina. We just have a different perspective. We're all created from the same God. He desires that all be saved through Jesus. He is preparing a place for people from all over the world of all nationalities and languages and to be together as brothers and sisters in Christ. That is our perspective as believers. We have the strongest message that there is in the world about racism. The church of Jesus has the strongest message. So it's a challenge to live it out. <laughs> you know why? There's, you can always find people you're mad at. <laughs> and sometimes they're grouped together, right? And things happen. But the larger perspective, the challenging one, is what Jesus is doing in the world, what God's plan is in the world. Um, it is, it is lifetime challenging. Here's, in, in just a, you know, next year at some point, January or February, Jesus is going to challenge us to love our enemies as ourselves. That's a mind-blowing statement. I know you're used to it. Oh, yeah, love your enemies as yourselves. Actually doing it? Really doing it? just seems impossible. Like, who put that on the program? Why? I don't like that part of my job description. Can we have a meeting? Can we excise that part, you know? Love your enemies as yourselves. And all I'm saying is that um, in the Word of God are these statements about who we are that are pretty powerful, more powerful than we realize sometimes. So, uh, Herod comes, and he kills the children, he doesn't value them as much as he does his power. Uh, and verse 17 says, Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. And so here's the sorrow that comes. Um, I think I have a note on that, right? The sorrow we have today, something like that. Um, so here's the sorrow that comes into our life. And I mentioned it with the kids, and I mentioned it when we got started. And I, I have to tell you, you're not really reading this story, if it doesn't make you kind of angry, that God saved his son, but not the other children. It should make you upset. And after you become upset, then it should make you think about your own life. Because there has to be something in your life if you've lived a while, that you feel has been unfair, that God could have stopped it, that God could have stepped in and made it different, that it doesn't make any sense to you, that God helped someone else out of that, but not me. Like I told a story about a car accident. Some of you might be thinking of, well, I had a loved one who was in a car accident, and they weren't rescued. He was, but my loved one wasn't. We, we have these, these moments, these things that happen. Actually, I forgot to uh, pray for um, Ken and Beth's brother, Wes, died, passed away this week. So I'm just going to pray for uh, the family. Father, we lift up Ken and uh, Beth to you and the whole family in the death of their brother, Wes, and pray that you give them uh, comfort as they go through this time of loss, and we pray for um, peace that comes with your presence. And um, Father, we know that all things are in your hands, even the things that are hard, that don't make sense to us, and we pray that you would uh, help them during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, when you read this story, to fully embrace the Christmas story, this is a part of it. And it's important, because God is sending Jesus to do what? Save us from our sins. Well, do you want an illustration of what sin looks like? How about the king whose job it is is to speak up and help those who have no power, goes and kills toddlers and babies so he can stay in power. Does that sound like sin to you? 
Yeah, it highlights our world is full of sin and evil, and we desperately need to be saved. And we need someone with authority to do that. Well, Jesus is identified at the beginning of the story as son of David. King, son of Abraham, the one through whom the whole world will be blessed. That's who he is. Born in Bethlehem, city of David. Rama. Rama is the place where the people of God were gathered before they were deported to Babylon. So at some point in Israel's history, Babylon came and tore down the city of Jerusalem, deported many of the people, Daniel, for example, deported many of the people to Babylon, and Rama is where they gathered the people, got them all organized, and then marched them off. And Rachel weeping for her children is connected to the nation going down, the city being destroyed, and the people being taken to a foreign land. That's what that verse is connected to. And when Matthew began, what was the high point? It, you got all these ge genealogies, son of, son of, son of, or father of, father of, father of. The high point was David, the king. What's the low point? Being deported to Babylon. That's the low point. And so the king, the new king, Jesus, the king of kings is born. That's going to be a high point. But here we have another low point. These children are killed by Herod. And a verse is quoted by Matthew, which invokes a place, Rama, the place where the people of God were gathered for deportation away from their home. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to leave Matthew and spend 10, 12 minutes in Jeremiah to see where this verse, what surrounds it. It's pretty amazing. I want to say one thing before we go and do that, though is I want to point out that uh, Herod, by the way, was not Jewish. He was, you know, king of the Jews, but he wasn't Jewish. He didn't care about Jewish nation or people or heritage. God loves his people, people of Israel, the people who were slaves in Egypt, the people he rescued through the leadership of Moses, the people who he brought into uh, the promised land through Joshua. He loves his people. He has promised to always love his people, the Jewish people. I am not Jewish, so I'm not promoting my own group here. He has promised to love his people, the Jewish people. Is anyone here Jewish? Did you do the ancestry thing and find out you're 2% Jewish? Okay, right there is a hand. All right, one person. Two, three. Oh, one, okay, 1%. One yeah, over the course of time, not a surprise. Uh, but most of us aren't. I point this out because this is another thing that we have as the people of God that Sometimes we get wrong. There have been times in the church's history where the church has been angry at Jewish people. They have, they have described Jewish people as the enemy, you know, the ones who killed Jesus. Uh, they don't follow the Messiah. They're the enemy. That's stupid talk, okay? <laughs> it's dumb, okay? I'm just telling you, as the people of God, if you read the Word of God, it's very clear. God loves His people, the Jews, and He is committed to them forever, and He is bringing them into His kingdom period. You can read it in the book of Romans. There's three chapters in the book of Romans where Paul talks about that, 9, 10, and 11. You can read about how much God loves his people. God loves his people, and he is going to bring them fully back into the kingdom. By the way, Jesus, what nationality was he or race? I don't even know the right word to use. Jewish, 12 disciples, they were all Jewish. Paul the apostle was Jewish, the only book in the New Testament written by a non-Jew is Luke. He's a Gentile. Everything else is written by a Jew in the New Testament. Every New Testament book is written by a Jew. God loves his people. So the people of God need to be clear on that. Uh, this keeps coming up in our world over the centuries. It's coming up again lately in the media. And I'm telling you, People who read God's word accurately, God loves his people. This doesn't mean like that the nation of Israel as a nation makes all the right choices. It doesn't mean you can't disagree with the policy that Israel has as a nation. Sure you can, just like any nation, just like your own. You can look at the U.S. and say, well, I love my country, but this policy I disagree with, right? 
You could do that with Israel. You could say God loves his people. This decision Israel's making, I disagree with that. But the people, the Jewish people, God loves them and he's committed to them. And you should know that and not get confused. And I just wanted to make a clear statement about that because it astounds me that this becomes a confusing thing again and again <laughs> and again and again. So I don't want you to be confused. All right, we're going to Jeremiah. I want you to see where this verse lies in Jeremiah. So uh, you'll need to pop that up on the screen for me. Um, did I have a thing right before this? We can hope because God is with us. All right, so Jeremiah 31, 1 through 6 says, At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. And when Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him in a far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourself with tambourines and shall go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall enjoy fruit, for there shall be a day when the watchman will call in the hill country of Ephraim, Arise, let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. So Jeremiah is giving these words to people who are being deported. And he's telling them, God loves you. He's not going to give up on you. His love is going to go with you. Okay, the next section. What did I title that? He's our forever father, verses 7 and 9. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the farthest places of the earth, among them the blind and the lame and the pregnant women, and she who is in labor, together with a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with pleas for mercy I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble, for I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. So he has forever love for us. He's our forever father. And the next verse, section, forever joy, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it to the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him, will keep him as the shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from his hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain and the wine and the oil and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life will be watered a garden, and they shall languish no more. And they sh uh, then shall the young women rejoice the in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will feast the soul of the priests with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. Forever love, forever father, forever joy. And then comes this verse, verse 15. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Now, this is a real emotion about real events that affect people deeply. But I want you to notice it's the only negative verse in this entire chapter. And that's encouraging. It's there because humans have sorrow. We have weeping. We have devastation. We have that. But when you know God, all of that is surrounded by his forever love, the fact that he's our forever father, joy, redemption, salvation. It puts it into perspective. That's the only sad verse in this whole chapter. And I think it's important for us to know that in order to read the Christmas story, that it contains this quotation, and fully understand what's happening there. Knowledge is a good thing, right? You want to know why following Jesus matters. What difference that makes. Does he really understand my problems? Uh, can I really relate to him? Can God reach down into my soul and understand the depth of my feeling? Can he bring any hope? You want to know that. 
the Word of God helps us understand that by giving us stories and pictures and, and events that we can hang on to and remember. And it, that's helpful. That's better than ignorance, right? Like, I must admit, sometimes I enjoy watching these little interviews that um, late night hosts do on the street. There was one where they asked people to name a country. They showed them a map of the world that was blank. Name a country. Any country. Anyone. The people could not name a country and, and find it on the map. Not one. Not even the one they lived in. <laughs> They even asked, well, where, where's the U.S.? And they pointed to the wrong continent, okay? So as far as following Jesus, let that not be a description of our spiritual journey. <laughs> Name a reason why following Jesus is important to you. I can't name one. You just don't want to be that kind of follower of Jesus. You want to be like, I think they finally got a sixth grader up there who said, you know, Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Honduras, Guatemala, Mexico, and just was going through the continents one by one. And here's the truth is, is that spiritually sometimes the children are the ones who lead, right? They're the ones who are close to Jesus, who are taking in the Bible stories, who are applying them to their life and thinking about what does this mean for me? All right. Well, let's move on. Next section, Forever Hope, verse 16. Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord, and you shall come back from the land of the enemy. There's hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. I have heard Ephraim grieving. You have disciplined me, and I was disciplined like an untrained calf. Bring me back that I may be restored, for you are the Lord, my God. For after I had turned away, I relented, and after I was instructed, I struck my thigh, and I was ashamed, and I was confounded, because I bore the disgrace of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he my darling child? For as often as I speak against him, I do remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. That's the kind of verse you need to hear and read, right? God saying, I will surely have mercy on you, because you're my son, you're my daughter. Next, forever peace, verse 25. Let me skip some verses here. For I will satisfy the weary soul, and every languishing soul I will replenish. That's a Bible verse that's sort of hidden here, Jeremiah 31, 25. For some of you, you might need to memorize that verse. For I will satisfy the weary soul, and every languishing soul I will replenish. Next, forever forgiveness. Verses 31 to 34. I'm just going to, uh, you can read these. This is where God says there's going to be a new covenant. New covenant. Where God's word is going to be written on our heart. Who brings the new covenant? Jesus, at the Last Supper, he says, he holds up the cup and says what? This is the new covenant in my blood. He's the one who brings the new covenant that brings forgiveness, forever forgiveness. And then I must have had one more at least. Uh, the next one. Forever promise, verse 35. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea to its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation from before me. God says, yeah, if all the stars disappear and, you know, the sea is, you know, then my promise will fail. That, that's a poetic way of saying, will God's promise fail? No. What's his promise? To love his people forever. It, that promise is not going to fail. This is the chapter that holds that sorrow. A voice is heard in Rama, Rachel weeping for her children. This is that chapter that speaks about God's forever love, how he's our forever father, how he brings forever joy, forever forgiveness through the new covenant that his son Jesus will bring, and how this promise is forever. The sorrow is acknowledged, but that's the full context of where the sorrow lives in the middle of God's love and 
his redemption and the joy that we have in knowing him, that's where it resides in the middle of all of that. Isn't that breathtaking? It's breathtaking. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up, and we're going to sing a couple songs to the Lord. And as the Lord speaks to you about your sorrow and your loss and your anger and your confusion and your version of uh, Rachel weeping, which we all have, ask God to communicate to you his forever love, his fatherhood, to help you feel like a son or a daughter who he has promised to love forever. Uh, Tell him that you need to feel that in your heart right now.